So um, all of you right now as I'm speaking, every person in this classroom, you're producing and using energy right now as I'm speaking. And that energy that you're producing right now is like directly affecting everything about you as a human being. Everything about you. It's affecting the way that you think. It's affecting the way that you um, move. It's affecting your physical health. It's affecting your emotional health. It's affecting your um, directly affecting your spiritual well-being. Everything about you is dictated by this energy. And you're producing all different types of energy right now. As an example, the left hemisphere of your brain is producing di different energy than the right hemisphere of your brain. Your emotional energy when you're happy is different than your emotional energy when you're sad. Your physical energy is different than your spiritual energy. So not only are you producing energy, but that energy that you're producing comes in lots of different formats. Also, that energy that you're producing is not staying only inside of your body. It's radiating outside of you right now as I speak. It's all around you. It's referred to as your biosphere. All of you right now, you're hearing me right now through energy. You're seeing me right now through energy. Your senses work through energy. We are energy beings and we are connected to the, our external environment through energy. That's the way we do that. You also have a sixth sense. How many of you have ever met somebody for the very first time and you shake their hand and without even knowing this person, you know immediately whether you like or dislike that person? Or how many of you um, have ever been on an elevator with somebody that you've never met before and you're, the person's standing behind you and you can tell if that person's in a good mood or a bad mood and you're not even looking at them? How do you do that? The way that you do those things is through energy. So not only are we communicating visually and hearing through energy, but you actually have the sixth sense also. So this energy, this biosphere, represents everything about you as a human being. And it dictates your health. You as an individual, you're only as healthy as your biosphere is. Your biosphere is your health and well-being. So there's a lot of different things that impact your ability to produce and utilize energy in a very balanced way. I keep using that word balanced because it's one of the key components. Your body is striving for homeostasis every single instance of your life. It's striving for this human balance. And so many times what happens is ourselves, our humans, we get in our own way of achieving this. And so by um, creating this, not just producing and utilizing energy, but creating it in a balanced way and using it in a balanced way is one of the keys to optimizing this. So where does all this energy come from that I'm talking about? Where the energy comes from, The energy comes from the sun. So um, all the energy that you, physical energy that you have in your body right now came to you from the sun. But we as a species, we can't get energy directly from the sun. We can't go outside and roll our sleeves up and be underneath the sun and get energy directly from it. So if all the energy in your body right now came from the sun and we can't get the energy from the sun, how did you get it? And most people think it's from the food that you eat, which is not true. How did the food that you eat get the energy from it? The answer to that question, is dirt. Dirt is one of the most important components of your entire health and well-being. It's absolutely the most important component of your biosphere is dirt. And people don't really even talk about it. Every single vitamin that's in your body right now, every one of them came to you from dirt. Every mineral that's in your body right now, every single mineral came to you from dirt. All the energy that's in your body right now came to you from the sun via dirt. All the water that's in your body right now has been filtered thousands of times by dirt before you consumed it. So many people consider gold or diamonds as our precious minerals. We actually refer to them as precious minerals. We as a species, we could live forever without gold and diamonds, but we couldn't even live one week without dirt. Dirt is our most precious mineral, and you are made up of exactly the same five minerals that dirt is. So the way that we treat dirt is indicative on the way that we treat human beings. If you kick it around and think it's something that you just discard and you don't really care much about it, that's how you treat other people also. That's how human people, um, humans treat other humans. And it shouldn't be that way because that dirt is the most important component of your health and well-being. It's dictating your own biosphere. So, as an example, there's many different types of dirt. You have high pH level dirt, you have low pH level dirt, you have acidic um, dirts, you have um, sandy dirt, um, you have d dirt that has high biomass um, involved in it, you have dirt that has certain tilth to it, 
Um, you know, there's all these different components of dirt, but people just aren't talking about that. In the 36 years that I've worked in the health and fitness industry, I've gone into hundreds and hundreds of health um, clubs and gyms and fitness centers, and I work with their personal trainers and their fitness staff to improve their health and well-being and improve their knowledge to pass it on to their, um, their clients. And in that 36 years of time, not once ever, not one time has anybody ever even said one thing about dirt. To this day, nobody said anything. But they know a lot about sets. They know a lot about repetitions. They know a lot about percent body fat. They know a lot about um, exercises and P90X and Insanity and Pilates. They know a lot about that stuff, which is the tip of the iceberg as far as your health and well-being concerned. But the very big foundation of it, dirt, nobody talks about it. And I mean nobody in that field. So one of the things that you want to try to be thinking about when improving your, bio, uh, your um, biosphere's ability to function optimally is what type of um, dirt or is the food being grown in that you're consuming? Uh, what kind of food is coming, what, what, kind of, um, what kind of food are you consuming from the different types of dirt that is being grown in? Is the food that you eat, is it um, being coming from dirt that has um, fertilizers and pesticides and larvicides and fungicides and growth stimulants added to it? Or is the food that you're consuming coming from dirt that's organically tended? Questions like this are the ones that need to be um, asked about in health clubs and fitness centers and so on, not how many sets you're doing or how many repetitions you're doing. Um, and until we have conversations like that, then we're missing the big picture. One of the things that I've noticed working in the health and, industry, health and fitness industry for so long is that most professionals in this industry are really, really good at hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. They're focusing on things that play a little teeny role in the big picture, but then the really big areas they're missing out on and they're not focusing on those. So one of the keys here is um, looking at some of these big pictures. Now as an example of that, there's a lot of different areas of your lifestyle that plays a big role in impacting your ability to produce and, and use energy. As I mentioned, one of the keys to this is dirt. Now one of the things is how you eat food, what types of food that you eat. What's called a primary energy source is food that's grown directly, um, you're, you're eating it directly from dirt, let's say like the fruits and vegetables. So what's happening there is you're getting the nutri nutrients from that soil, you're getting the vitamins and minerals from that, that soil, you're getting the sun's energy via that food, and you're putting it into your system. That's affecting your biomass, your biosphere in a very positive way. That's what's called a primary energy source. But what happens when human beings eat a cow? or a chicken or a pig. What's happening is that cow ate the grass, which is a primary energy source, and that grass got the energy directly from the dirt via the sun. And so what happened, what happened in that situation is that when you eat a cow or a chicken or a pig, that cow is keeping almost three quarters of all those nutrients, those vitamins and the minerals from the dirt, it's keeping it for itself. And so you're only getting about a quarter of that. You're only getting about a quarter of the sun's energy that you could be getting in that situation. So one of the things that you want to try to be thinking of if you're trying to maximize your, your biosphere's ability to function optimally is to think about are you consuming um, primary energy sources or secondary energy sources or are they even further down the food chain? So think about where your food was grown and how close to the original source it is. Another thing that people don't think a lot about when, uh, when dealing with their biosphere or their energy is about sleep. Sleep is one of the most important components of your entire health and well-being. And people talk about it, but again, they talk about it in a way that they're hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. So as an example, when I talk to people about sleep, one of the first things they always say is how much time you spend sleeping. If I sleep for seven hours a night, they think if you sleep for eight is more better. If you sleep for eight, nine obviously is better. And that is absolutely a fallacy. The length of time that you spend sleeping plays a very small role in how much benefit you get out of your sleep. So in order to improve your ability to maintain deep states of sleep, what you're trying to do is to improve your body's ability to stay in these very, very deep stages. So when you sleep, you go through four different stages of sleep. And that third and fourth states are the third and fourth stages are the deepest states of sleep and that's where you receive the majority of the benefits of your sleep from. So as an example, you might know people that only need five or six hours of sleep a night and they feel great. And you might also know people that need 10 or 12 hours of sleep a night and they're still tired all the time. Why does that happen? 
And the reason being is because those people don't only need six or seven hours of sleep a night, they're getting a lot of benefits in a very short period of time because they're spending the majority of their night's rest in a very deep stage of sleep. Whereas those people are only getting, <clears throat> they're, they're sleeping for 10 or 12 hours a night, they're only getting a little bit of benefit over a long period of time because they spend very little time in deep sleep. So how do you dictate or how do you control your ability to maintain deep states of sleep? Do you just put your head on the pillow at night and say, oh, I'm going to sleep really deep tonight? No. <laughs> the way that you do that is through the very first thing that I mentioned today. I mentioned that all of you are producing and using energy right now, and that energy is affecting, directly impacting everything about you as a human being, including your ability to maintain deep states of sleep. And the way that it does that is if you were to map out your energy patterns over the course of this waking day today, while you're actually awake, like right now, what you would see, what you wouldn't see, is that your energy just stays constant all day long. It doesn't do that. It's constantly fluctuating. Your energy levels go up and down, up and down all day long. If you were to map out those fluctuations in energy patterns over the course of a day or a week or a month even better, what you would see is that those fluctuations start to create patterns or rhythms. And those rhythms are called your circadian rhythms. They control when you go from one stage of sleep to the next stage of sleep and how much time you spend in each one of those stages of sleep. And so what controls your ability to maintain deep states of sleep is your energy patterns while you're awake. What you're doing right now is going to be affecting your sleep tonight. They're completely dictating your sleeping patterns. So as an example, if tonight you decide that you're going to go to bed at 9 o'clock tonight, tomorrow night you decide you're going to go to bed at midnight, the next day you decide you're going to wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning, the next day you're going to wake up at noon time. What's happening if you're um, throwing off your sleeping patterns, your circadian, circadian rhythms, is you're preventing your body's ability to maintain deep states of sleep. So one of the things that our species learned very early on, can we do one more? Right there. One thing that our species um, uh, learned very early on as we evolved over about two million years is that um, our ancestors had really, really poor night vision. We learned as a species that if we were walking around at night, we wouldn't be the hunters anymore. We'd be the hunted. So what we did during our evolution is when it got dark outside, we settled down and went to sleep. When it got light outside in the morning, we woke up, started walking around. It's dis designed in your DNA. It's instilled in you that when the sun goes down at night, you decrease your ability to digest food, you decrease your ability to metabolize food, you decrease your ability to think analytically, you decrease your ability to think creatively, you decrease your ability to perform physical activity, decrease your ability to recover from physical activity, and on and on and on and on, stress management, so on. Everything slows down once that sun slows down. So you are designed to be following the patterns of the sun. So when you, it gets dark outside, you're designed to be going to sleep. When it gets light out in the morning, you're designed to wake up. So all of a sudden, this guy comes along and invents the light bulb, and we think that we can change two million years of evolution in a blink of an eye. It doesn't work that way. Um, so even though that the society's saying that because of these light bulbs, you should be staying up later at night, your DNA's not telling you that. Your biosphere is not telling you that because it's designed to follow the, the cycles there. So one of the things that we want to try to be thinking about with sleep is trying to create patterns associated with how you go to sleep. Research shows that most of you in this classroom right here, you go to sleep at different times on the weekends than you do during the weekdays. Most of you wake up at different times on the weekends than you do the weekdays. So your circadian rhythms are functioning one way during the week, but functioning in a different way on the weekends. Which means that when come Monday morning comes along and your alarm goes off, you think that your metabolism is going to switch back over. You think your circadian rhythm is going to switch right back over to your normal sleeping patterns during the week. But the reality is it takes two days for your circadian rhythms to recover from that, which means Monday night your body's still recovering from that. Your circadian rhythms are thrown off. Tuesday night your circadian rhythms are thrown off. Wednesday night you sleep really good. And Thursday night you sleep really good. And this what gets what happens on Friday? It throws off again which means two nights a week the average person is sleeping well, which is one-third of the week, which is one-third of your life you're sleeping well. And that sleep is one of the biggest indicators of your biosphere, how balanced your biosphere is, how well you manage stress, how well you digest and metabolize food, how well you recover and adapt to physical activity, on and on and on and on. It's one of the biggest indicators of that. 
Now another big component of this is what time you eat food. When you eat food, what you're doing is you're putting the sun's energy into your body. And when you do that, it creates a stimulus to your metabolism called a thermogenic effect. So as an example, if tonight you decide that you're gonna eat dinner at seven o'clock tonight, which is a decision that most of you guys make several times a day, in my opinion, one of the very most important decisions that each of you make on a daily basis revolving around your overall health and well-being. So when you eat that food tonight at seven o'clock, you stimulate your metabolism tonight at seven o'clock. But let's say tomorrow night, you don't get a chance to eat dinner at seven o'clock. Let's say you're running late and you can eat at nine o'clock instead. So one night you stimulate your metabolism at seven o'clock, the next night at nine o'clock. That's thrown off the cycles of your metabolism by two hours. That's thrown off your circadian rhythms by two hours. For most of you, two hours represents a quarter of your entire night's rest. So you've just taken a quarter of all the benefits of your sleep and you just tossed it out the window because you made a very simple decision to go to, um, to have dinner one night at five o'clock, next night at seven o'clock or seven and nine, whatever I'm saying. So the point here is you want to try to create patterns not only with sleeping patterns, but you also want to do the same thing with eating patterns. So as an example of what I'm talking about, most of you tomorrow at lunchtime, you actually think, consciously think whether you should be having a salad for lunch tomorrow or let's say a cheeseburger tomorrow for lunch. You'll actually consciously think about that. But what you guys will not be doing is thinking whether you should be eating that lunch tomorrow at 12 o'clock or at two o'clock. And that difference in time is affecting your metabolism and your biosphere much, much more so than the difference in the number of calories between that cheeseburger and that salad. That's a good example of somebody hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. They're so focused on something that doesn't play a big role, but then they're missing the big picture. What time you eat food? What would happen one day if you work out, do some physical activity, which is contracting your muscles, which is the number one most metabolically active substance in your body, your, your, your muscles. What happens if one day you work out at seven o'clock in the morning, which creates a thermogenic effect at seven o'clock in the morning. The next day you work out at seven o'clock at night, the next day you don't work out at all, and so on and so on. What's happening is you're throwing off the cycles of your metabolism through physical activity. So it's not just that you're being physically active that's important, it's how you're creating patterns around that physical activity. So one last thing I'd like to say is that um, this biosphere that you're talking that we're talking about to improve your health, it's not just affecting you. Your biosphere is not about you because you come in contact with other people, eventually you're gonna come in contact with their biosphere. All of you have people in your life that you love to hang out with, that you love to be around, they lift you up, they have good spirits, they make you feel good. You also have people in your life that you don't like to be around, they bring you down, they bring your energy down. What kind of person are you? Are you the kind of person that lifts people up or bring them down? What kind of energy do you bring to your work environment? What kind of energy do you bring to this classroom right here? What kind of energy do you bring home or into your relationship? How is your biosphere affecting other people? And so it's that pay it forward concept, that ripple out effect. It's not just that my energy is gonna affect you, but then you're gonna go and talk to somebody or be around somebody that I didn't even meet. So my energy can affect somebody that I don't even come in contact with. So when we talk about your biosphere, we're not talking about you. We're talking about how you're impacting your society, the people that you come in contact with. And the last thing I'll say is that that um, we are part of nature. Our species is part of nature. Just like the Earth, we just celebrated Earth Day as part of nature. We have a biosphere exactly the same as the Earth has a biosphere. It's exactly the same, it works exactly the same. We humans are the number one biggest negative impact on the Earth's biosphere to function in a homeostasis or balanced uh, format. So if you want to be thinking about what you can do to prevent global warming or improve the, the, the earth or so on, you don't have to come up with all these crazy ideas. All you have to do is start with yourself first because your biosphere is what's impacting that and that's going to impact the next person. So be the change that you want to try to see around the world and so on. Thank you for your time.